the three types of terror. The gross out. The sight of a severed head tumbling down a flight of stairs. It's when the lights go out and something green and slimy splatters across your arm. The horror. The unnatural. The spiders the size of bears. The dead walking up and walking around. It's when the light goes out and something with claws grabs you by the arm. And the last and worst one. Terror. When you come home and notice everything you own had been taken away and replaced by an exact substitute. It's when the light goes out and you feel something behind you. You hear it. You feel its breath against your ear. But when you turn around, there's nothing there. Stephen King. I just wanted to start this video out by saying I know I don't upload a lot of scary videos on my channel. It's usually just me and my friends messing around in CS2 or Overwatch 2. However, that doesn't mean I don't like scary stuff. In my free time when I'm playing Call of Duty or something, I'll usually have a video like terrifying photos that can't be explained on in the background. So you might be asking, what changed? Why make a horror video now? And well, ever since I was a kid, I've been searching for a perfect horror game, and I feel I finally found it. Stephen King once said there are three types of horror. Gross out horror, the horror horror, and then there's terror. There's gross out horror games, bloody games that might jump scare you a little, like Until Dawn, Outlast, or Dead Space, which have their time and place, but it doesn't really stick with you after you beat it. There's the horror horror games, where games where it jump scares you with ghosts and whatnot, games like Slender, SCP-87B, or Five Nights at Freddy's, the movie wasn't that bad, surprisingly. Which is okay, I guess, but once you get jump scared, it's kind of over. And there's the terror horror games, or disturbing horror games, as I like to put it. Games that stick with you after it's over. Games you think about. Games you cannot get out of your head and are just plain disturbing. Games like Silent Hill 2, Doki Doki Literature Club, or Least of the Painful. These are the best. Games that have stuck with me for the long haul, and I sometimes just think about them in the back of my head and get a chill. But there's one of these terror horror games, or disturbing horror games, I discovered recently that blows the rest out of the water. It's almost a combination of all three genres. It's a little bloody. It's got frightening visuals, but it also has some things that just stick with you. What makes all of this stick harder is that the game doesn't spoon-feed you the whole story. It makes you come to your own conclusions based on how you interpret the events in the game, based on your worldview and limited information that the game gives you. The game is Fear and Hunger. Fear and Hunger is a game made in 2018 by a guy named Miro Havernin. I apologize if I butchered that name, I'm sure I did. It's considered a survival horror game. The game is incredibly hard and forgiving. That's probably why I got that. Now, I love a good hard game. My top two favorite games of all time are Kingdom Hearts and Dark Souls, two game series that many people consider very difficult. But people have already talked about Fear and Hunger's difficulty in other videos, so I won't focus on that too much, but I believe that's why it's considered a survival horror. Here's the short premise. You get to choose one of four people to play as. They are completely different in every way except they are converging on one point at this point in time. They are looking for a man named Griffith, <coughs> uh, a man named Lagarde, who is currently imprisoned in a hellish dungeon. The Dungeon of Fear and Hunger. You might be asking, you broke your normal video genre to make a video about a survival horror games? Is it really that terrifying and disturbing? Yeah. Yeah, it is. The art style is one of the most terrifying aspects of this game. The things that I can point out right off the bat are the Harvester, the White Angel, the Cave Mother, and of course the God of Fear and Hunger. Which alone would make this game a terror horror game, or a disturbing horror game, which would be great. It goes deeper. The themes of the game are... disturbing, to say the least. There's a couple concepts, uh, such as marriage. No, not the happy when a man and a woman love each other type marriage, a, a different type. A marriage of flesh, in both the figurative and... <clears throat> literal sense. As in, two people melding into one and creating a new person in a very, very literal sense. Later in the game, you come across this guard melded with the dog. You, you see what I'm implying here, right? In other words, in the game, you can merge two people in together, making them stronger in a gross amalgamation of the two through showing love, as it says. Another concept that always interests me is psychology. The act of going insane. What people who go insane see and hear. Sometimes the game will taunt you when your sanity is low, giving you intrusive thoughts at the bottom of your screen. 
You feel an ominous feeling about this room. You're starting to lose your mind. Yeah, suicide is an option. There is something primal about your own mind telling you horrible things and you can't stop it. The theme of finding civilization before humanity, as well. The ones that came before us. Old gods, like Cthulhu, or gods that no one really knows about, and the ancient gods that are not concerned with humans. Then, another theme that I really love is forbidden knowledge. Knowledge so forbidden that if you learn of it, there's no going back. Things and information that make people go crazy just trying to understand it. It goes deeper. The sound design can make or break a game. There are two major parts of sound design I would like to focus on, that being the music and the sound effects or background noises. The more obvious of the two is music. The music of anything can make or break an art piece, in my mind. I like to listen to video game music in my free time a lot, so it's really important especially to me. The music of this game is creepy. One of my favorite art projects of all time is Everywhere at the End of Time, a six-hour soundtrack that is supposed to simulate dementia, and let me tell you, there's nothing more terrifying in real than that. Creepy music in games isn't new, however. I'd point you to the River Twigs bed from Super Paper Mario, Who Are You from Final Fantasy VII, the original one, and my personal creepiest before I played this game, Blood First S from Lisa the Painful. This game has some truly horrifying tracks to rival Blood for Sex, even. There's two I want to talk about in particular. The Four Apostles. This one you'll hear a good amount, and it's usually during minor bosses, like the cave mother we talked about earlier. First, there's this background squeaking. It's a sound that makes me want to grit my teeth. It's like a squeaky marker on a dry erase board just scribbling. It's, it's horrible. But that, coupled with the quick raising and lowering of notes, makes it feel like danger. I've heard songs before that make me feel the danger, such as The Hunter and Ludwig the Accursed or Holy Blade from Bloodborne. If you don't understand what I'm saying by saying that, go and have a listen to those two. I'll have them linked. But those are more grandiose. This feels like you're in danger, but you're not going to die to some amazing godly being that's badass. You're going to die to something that no one even knows about. And you're going to die feeling nothing but despair. The track that I think shows terror the most is not boss music, it doesn't make you feel in danger, in fact it's almost kind of calming. The track is called Mahab Streets, or Mahabra Streets, I don't know how to pronounce it. This track starts with a high pitched melody, it's loud, but calming in a really weird way. Then it reverses the music really fast like a VHS tape in reverse. It does this a couple times, then adds some dissonant whispers that you can't quite make out anything in. Then it goes completely quiet except for a few instruments here and there. Now to me, this is not so dangerous sounding like the other one. This one reminds me of Everywhere at the End of Time, in a weird way. It almost feels like something a, a little too real. What I picked up on almost feels like I'm reliving the end of something over and over again. Like I'm experiencing the death of something, but the next thing never comes. It just keeps replaying the death over and over and over again, whether that thing that's ending is civilization, a town, a race of people, or just me. It's calming, but in a sort of, it's finally over feeling. The second part of this is the actual sound part of it, you know, the sound effects or the background noises. This game can unsettle you with just this. Imagine this, you're alone playing this game at night, you're deep underground. You're walking with your party and all the enemies in the room are dead. You're doing a once over to see if you can find any food or items that you may have missed. Then you hear walking. Not your characters walking, but walking something close by. Just footsteps. There's nothing in this room. There is nothing in this room. Way later in the game, there's an enemy that I will not spoil that you can just hear very loud footsteps. And the closer the enemy is, the louder and faster that the louder and faster they go, until you hide. Here, take a listen. It 
It doesn't help that some things are deafeningly loud in this game. One that always gets me is when a certain message appears at the bottom of your screen. A terrifying presence has entered the room, accompanied by a very shrill noise. Even after beating the game several times, if I start up a new playthrough and I see this message and this noise, my immediate thought is, I have to get out of here right now. But what does this message mean, Pugzer? We aren't there yet. But I'll explain this real quick, because this enemy in particular is a huge reason why this game is terrifying. You'll see this message for the first time, maybe 20 minutes into your first playthrough. First time I saw it, I got really scared, but nothing happened. This happened a couple times and nothing happened, so I just assumed it was nothing. Something just to mess with me? There are a couple things in this game like that, where they just kind of mess with you. They're just kind of trying to troll you a bit, so I just figured it was one of those. Okay, let's continue. Wait, what is that? I thought I killed all the enemies here. Huh. Okay, I guess we're fighting now. Oh, it's pretty strong. Oh. Holy fuck! Yeah, this is the Crow Mauler. If you see that message, especially early in the game, leave the room and come back. This will get rid of him. It's inspired by Pyramid Head from Silent Hill 2, obviously, just look at it. But as someone who's played both of these games as an adult, both Silent Hill 2 and Fear and Hunger, this thing is way scarier to me. It is perhaps not as unnatural looking as Pyramid Head, but it feels more dangerous. Sure, the Crow Mauler is actually killable, in fact, you should kill him to get one of the strongest weapons in the game. But there is nothing like seeing that message for the first time in an early playthrough when you have no idea what is coming, and then he just appears. The Crow Mauler is almost something of a meme in the community, too, because of how terrifying and difficult it is in the early game. I've rambled long enough now. I want to describe my journey playing this game now, though. I heard about this through a random YouTube video that was the guy just explaining it. I started this video about two months ago and kind of got bored while listening to it, and I wasn't really listening when I was playing Overwatch, and I came down with a cold pretty soon after it. Flash forward to about October 20th of this year, I saw someone's top 25 games of all time list on Twitter, and someone had fear and hunger on it. I had a moment of realization that I'd heard that of that game somewhere before. It seemed kind of interesting, but I kind of caught, but I kind of stopped watching the video on it for some reason. It was probably boring. Then curiosity got the better of me, and I found the video that I started watching. I watched about 10 more minutes or so, actually paying attention this time, and I was hooked. I stopped the video immediately so I wouldn't spoil anything, and bought the game for four dollars on sale on Steam. Now a distinction, real quick. Uh, there's a lot of videos that categorize this game's difficulty in extreme detail, and I'm not going to focus on it that much. And if you want to go see that, you can look up plenty of other video essays on this game. It's hard, yeah, but as I've established, I want to talk about the terror of this game, not so much the difficulty. Okay, at the beginning, you're tasked with choosing a class. You can be a mercenary, have decent combat and versatility, and open locked doors. The safe option. You could choose the knight, decent versatility, good combat, Great strength, great defense, or you could choose the Outlander. All combat, baby. Massive amounts of strength, but not much else. Along with some perks that make hunger nigh an afterthought to you. Or you could be like me and choose the Dark Priest, and more why I did that later. The mercenary is here to find Lagarde for money. It's just a job to him, but he really needs the money for his wife and soon-to-be child. Understandable. The knight is in the dungeon of fear and hunger to find Lagarde as well because he is her captain, her knight in shining armor. Noble goal. The Outlander wants to find Lagarde for revenge. Thorfinn here wants to kill Lagarde, as he and his group of knights have killed everyone he's ever loved. I understand that. Then there's the Dark Priest, a character that lets you in on the fact that this isn't really a Skyrim-type fantasy game, but more a Berserk Eclipse-esque fantasy game. If you get my drift here. He wants to find Lagarde because he's a man of some sort of prophecy, some sort of antichrist figure here to shepherd a new age. Strange but intriguing. So you choose your character, you get some prompts for your perks, and you're off. This game is a classic RPG Maker style game. Think Ebe, the Crooked Man, or Undertale, but with actually working in meaningful combat. I started up the game and walked out grabbing stuff out of barrels, you know, normal video game stuff. Then I heard deafeningly loud barking and a message appeared at the bottom of my screen. You hear distant barking from afar. I thought it was strange, but continued. It got closer and closer, and then the dogs came out.
and Maul beat it up. Back to the title screen. The combat in this game isn't easy, to say the least. It's similar to Undertale in the way you do damage to your opponents. But you have to manage your entire party separately. You can lose limbs making certain weapons, or just weapons in general, impossible to use for the rest of the playthrough. And on top of that, the few save points that you find, you have to win a coin flip to actually save. And if you lose it, you're faced with a battle. These coin flips are annoying mechanic because I have lost six coin flips in a row, which is a 1.5% chance. Okay. Alright, this time we're going to go on this area to my left. To not die to the dogs. I find these strange octopus things unsettling in appearance, but not all that dangerous. Good enemies to train on, right? The best thing you could do in this game, in normal circumstances, is just avoid combat. Because... You don't get any XP or anything meaningful from most fights. And if you chose any class but the Dark Priest, it could be easier, but I'd rather sacrifice my difficulty in the early game for an easier later game. The reason I chose the Dark Priest is because it can resurrect the dead and not have to rely on party members. Not only that, I can become really strong later on and not lose a party member to, be, to partake in marriage like you're supposed to. Because I'm a Dark Priest, I can marry a zombie instead of a party member. Is that gross if you think about what I'm saying a little hard? Yeah. But we're all adults here, and this is a disturbing horror game, as I've mentioned. You make your way through the dungeons with lots of genitalia. There's going to be a ton of sensor bars <laughs> that I have to edit in. Until you find a prison. And under this prison is a deep, dark cavern. Further down than you can even see. Pitch black. You make your way down through this prison, and you'll find a lever. You pull it, and go up some stairs, and it gives you an elevator down further into the caverns. Once you get down, there is still a pitch black hole. All the way down here. How deep does this go, you wonder? In this room, stay away from the edges of the big black hole. If you do not, you will encounter the cave mother. The thing we talked about earlier, and if you're just getting here, you're more than likely die to it. Having to go back to your last save, which in this game means a long walk back. You can keep going until you find a mine shaft. In this mine shaft, you can find some ritual circles. One that you can sacrifice party members to, or show love to. We all know what this means. Your flesh will meld to the person you are showing love to, and you can make a marriage. The reason you even consider this, losing a party member or a zombie, is because the marriage is incredibly strong. Stronger than any other class by a mile. Your attack power will skyrocket, even higher than the Outlander. And you can still use all the equipment you want. You can do it twice, too. But be careful. Marrying another person or zombie after already being a marriage yourself will turn you into an abominable marriage. A grotesque mound of flesh that isn't quite right in all the wrong ways. Unable to hold a weapon due to the malformed nature of the marriage of three people. You will be stronger physically, but at what cost? No weapons, no armor. I'd say you're actually weaker. Going further into the mines will bring you to one of four paths, only one of them leading you to a guard. One leads you to an axolotl? Dragon? You would be able to laugh at this if there was a save point anywhere close to this. One way will lead you to a group of men in wolf masks, engaging in blood orgies. I still don't know why they're here in this. I don't know anything about this, and I've read extensively of the lore of this game. I don't know why they're here. Anyway, another way leads to an underground village protecting the Fortnite cube for some reason. More on that one later. Then the last way will lead you further down into the deepest parts of the dungeon of the game. Here you will find strange organs just lying around, seemingly connected to something you can't see, but you can only hear a faint heartbeat. Cutting these organs seemingly does nothing. For now. You can keep going down this path with the message, you realize you've delved too deep appearing at the bottom of your screen. Which seems weird, because you can take the long trip back up to the surface and still leave. Right? You're tasked with doing everything I've said before this in only 30 minutes. If you do, you're rewarded with Lagarde being barely alive inside this cage, and he can become a permanent party member. This may seem like a ton of time, but it took me four or five tries to do this. Lagarde will have amnesia, not understanding where he is, just knowing his name is Lagarde. You add him to your party and you start making your way back. You feel your journey is finally complete. If this is your first playthrough, this will have been an ordeal. Like I said, it's very hard. You might be beaten and battered, lost several limbs due to infection, and have no healing items left. I know the first time I got here, I had nothing left here. I was missing an arm and a leg on my main character, and missing arms on the other two. You get Lagarde out of his cage, and pretty soon after, he will look backwards. He'll say he needs to do something still. He, he came here for a reason. 
He can't remember what it is, but his job's not finished. There are mysteries still left unearthed here. Now, once again, if this is your first playthrough and like me, I was like, uh, nah, we're getting out of here now. The crow mauler could be literally just around any corner ready to maul my crows, so let's just get out of here. So you hurry up and get him out. You find your way all the way back up out of the dungeon. You finally get to the entrance, and finally you step into the sunlight, and you're about to leave. When the guard pipes up, I'm not finished. I need to do and find what I finally came here for. My first playthrough, I told him, yeah, good luck with that, and left. And I did it. I beat fear and hunger. I escaped the horrible dungeon, barely. I walked away with my head held high, ready to finally get off this game, go play some CS2. Something's wrong. Something is very wrong. As you walk away, both you and your character think, I made it out of the dungeon. Right? Suddenly, at the end of the scene, you're back in the dungeon. Do you remember that message earlier? You realize you've delved too deep. The darkness has entered your mind and you've gone mad. Or perhaps the knowledge you have seen has tainted you. You can never leave. So, you restart and do everything we talked about until now, until you get to Lagarde in time. When he looks back and says there's something he still needs to do. Go back and see what he's looking at. It's a big stone door with carvings and a cube-shaped hole. Remember that village with the Fortnite cube we talked about earlier? Well, if you go through this entire section with the village, you can find this artifact, take it, everyone in the village will become hostile, but you can get out. Or if you stay and investigate the giant fleshy light form just sitting there, once again, more on that later, bring the cube back down to the door and you'll discover something frightening. You will walk through the door only to find a giant city buried underground, a long forgotten city that seems to have been lost to time. The giant city is where most of the disturbing horror of this game takes place. You'll walk around in the city, finding it pretty empty, just tons of supplies, as if everyone here just disappeared one day. It's dark, obviously, it's underground. When you climb as far down in the city as you can, you'll find an impossible building. The only thing you can do is insert your cube into the strange machine near you. It transports you somewhere identical, but you feel it's different. Perhaps it took you back in time. Perhaps it's showing you an echo of the last moments of the city, I really don't know. You just can see the shadows of the people living there, moving as if nothing's wrong. Instead of being underground, you're on the surface, the cold sun shining down on you while you traverse this long-forgotten city. From here, you can find these machines that transport you back and forth between current day and the echo of the past. There are slight differences, but you'll need to traverse to do some puzzles. You can go to the right and find the Tower of Endless. As you approach, you'll get the message, you can see a lone tower rising from the darkness. Giving a frightening atmosphere, or melancholic, depending on if you're in the present day or the echo, you climb the tower. If you climb in the present day, there's a much needed save point, and a ritual circle if you're in need of a marriage or sacrifice, but nothing else. If you climb the tower during the Echo, it seems you can save here too, but you can't just yet. If you try to save, you'll be transported to a dream, or something like a dream. It'll just seem a little off. You'll be transported to Yarnum. <clears throat> I mean, Rondon. Here you'll see some backstory of all the characters. You'll see the Dark Priest first, you'll see him about to be sacrificed to the gods, on his last legs, well, on this sacrificial altar, he gets a vision of some new god, and is told some forbidden knowledge. He understands, and he asks to be left off the altar. You can walk around and see the city a bit. You can see a plague taking hold, poverty, and an evil cat. I don't know why this is here, but it's here. You can happen upon a brothel, where the mercenary can be found talking to his pregnant wife about doing this job and finding a guard for money. He needs it for his family. You can leave now, and go back to where you saw the people with the plague, and you can proceed through this way. You're in the northern lands now, seeing the outlander hovering over his superior, who was killed by Lagarde. He realizes when he was gone that his village was raped and pillaged by Lagarde. Perhaps Lagarde wasn't the best guy after all. The Outlander realizes that his family was still in this village. He runs to them. You should follow him, but this forest is confusing. That sounds familiar. NOT THE DOGS AGAIN!
Once you find the house where the Outlander has his family in it, he'll walk out of it after seeing what was inside, just muttering to himself. Unforgivable. Unforgivable. Now, you walk in and expect to see the Outlander's dead, bloody family, given the track history of this game, but no. It's just a granny, hovering over that one wheel that's in RuneScape that you used to make rope. And now you're fighting her. You can get one turn in, killing this helpless granny, then she shows herself. The Skin Granny. A horrible looking, uncanny, mechanical granny with three arms. Well, what's the worst that could happen, right? I sure hope that. She takes your face. Insta kill. This fight is one of the most unforgiving in the game. You can't run. And if you die here in the dream, you die in your life. Catherine style. My strategy here is to take all of her arms out immediately. It doesn't matter if you think you're stupid strong enough and you can one-shot her or something. Take out her arms. Because if her arms are gone, she can't take your face. Now you might think this is just a random moment for shock value and difficulty, but it does actually have meaning. In folklore, it is said that the people that abandon their families will have them replaced by skin grannies. No distinction, nothing about them says they're fake, but you just know. These people are not your family. After you kill the skin granny, you, you are shown both the knight story and Lagard story in tandem. The knight and Lagard are standing under a tree, talking about how all the common people already love Lagard, and he should just start his own kingdom. But they find it a little unsettling that there are prophecies about Lagard and, and him being some anti-Christ-like being. I wonder why this sounds familiar. It then cuts to Lagard talking to himself about how it's silly how they think it's a prophecy and he'll do it on his own. After the horrible a dream's abrupt end, you're shown a woman. A pregnant woman. She offers you her soul if you take her baby to the depths of the dungeon to become a god. You can agree or disagree, and I agreed in this case. <laughs> Why not at this point? You then wake up. Weird dream, right? You go back to the beginning of the city and go a different route. You can either do this route in the present or in the Echo. If you do it in the present, you'll find the Lord of the Flies, which some people looks like Gordon Ramsay, but I, I just don't see it. Which is not an easy fight, so we're just going to go through on the Echo. Here's where you see the Uterus. Another unsettling enemy in this game, an artistic looking robot with a fleshy fetus in its uterus. Which as the turns of the fight go on, the baby will fall out and crawl towards you. Uh huh, just going to let that one stir for a second. Once you get past like three or four of these grieving mothers, you'll find my favorite NPC in the game, the wizard, which doesn't do much, or he doesn't really look like a wizard much either, and I make sure to point this out to him every time, but he sells you potions of body and potions of mind, which will fully heal your HP or sanity, respectively, for cheap. You can walk out here and find the Harvestman. That one terrifying NPC we talked about earlier. The Harvestman here is a reference to Kurt Cobain's album Montage of Heck, as you can see here. But the overworld sprite will get you ready for the terror of this thing. It combines 3D aspects with the classic 2D RPG maker sprite. And it's just awful. If you get in combat with you, it won't do anything. Just smile and whistle. Sometimes it'll pet you gently with one of its arms. But it will just stand there and let you kill it. Unless it grabs you. Do not let it grab you. Do not let it grab you. Do not let it grab you. Do not bar it up. Once you take care of that thing, you are free to now fight the other two bosses in the city. If you go to the left and find the Grand Library and solve the mannequin puzzle in here, once you get in the door that the puzzle opens, you will see a man jump down seemingly to his death into another deep hole. Now, you would naturally go down and see if he's okay, but once you get there, face to face with a god. This fight is one of the easiest bosses in the city in my opinion. 
If you talk to him, you'll just be asked questions based on lore one by one. If you know the lore of the game, or are just lucky, you can make him take a shit ton of damage. But once you finish the fight, you're granted the second soul. That's two souls of the new gods now. The most frightening and disturbing god is next. Walk to the south of the city and find this weird little white being strung up in chains. Seemingly dead. Go a little northwest from this white creature and find the Temple of Torment. Walk in while in the Echo and find the deepest part. Screams will grow more violent the further you go in and... I actually learned this in this playthrough, uh, these things are here? <laughs> which seem to do nothing but scream, which is not okay. You'll find the torture room in the deepest part with no other way to proceed but torture and sacrifice one of your own party. Now, I can't show the beginning of this, but you have to physically tear the skin off your party member. The more the pain meter goes up, the more this guy appears behind you. The tormented one. The third god. All you gotta do is take out his arms and then it's easy. Go back and continue until... Your party member's dead. Blood will fill the floor and prompt you to go back. You can go back to the beginning of the temple now filled with blood. Tormented one now in it. This is the real fight. It's easy the first time, but it all changes when the message appears at the bottom of your screen. You feel something terrible is about to happen. Something never meant to be witnessed by human eyes. <laughs> The Tormented One is now in a metal torture device meant to look like a biblically accurate angel, but in the center is the skinned man, and the rings around are not made of light, but cold metal. The fight is incredibly hard. Way too hard to fight with only three party members. You lose. The end. But what if you had all four party members? You see, if you jump into this random hole next to the white creature before you go in the temple, you can find a secret lab. One in which you can make an exact clone of yourself, then when you head back, you can sacrifice your clone instead of a party member. Now, I don't have many complaints about this game, other than sometimes my frame rate drops and I have a 3090, just saying, an RPG Maker game should not do that. And this is my other complaint. I feel that this should not be an option in this horrible, terrifying, disturbing game. I wish that this was not in the game. Not the skinless god part, or the skinning your party member, but I feel it's almost like a cop-out. It takes me out of the experiment, the experience for a moment to know that I can circumvent the whole skinning my party member thing. I don't know, I feel like it's almost weird in a game that is so brutal and unforgiving in the difficulty and doesn't pull any punchles in the moral sense. Giving you an out like this seems kind of weird to me. All you have to do is jam the torture rings by attacking the outer runs, and he won't be able to attack. Now you have all the new god souls. Once you walk out of the temple, everything stops. The music stops. The game informs you that the city has become eerily quiet. As you make your way back to the center of town, you will realize that that white creature is out of the chains it was in. That's probably not a good sign. When you make your way back, you'll notice that the white angel is stalking you in every room you're in. Now the best thing to do here, in my opinion, is just ignore it and do your best to get away from it. You're probably beaten and battered already from the tormented one, and this thing can just straight slice off limbs whenever it wants. So it's just the best to avoid the damn thing. It's uncanny, it's weird, and I don't like the look of it. It's just not worth it. When you get to the center of town, you can go back to the present and challenge the Guardian. This is a weirdly relatively easy fight for so late in the game. Go through the Golden Temple and find the King's Passage key, and then leave. You can once again go back to the Echo, and then go through the temple once again. Now open in the Echo through the use of the King's Passage Key, and find the final god in the city. <laughs> he'll give some basic evil bad guy speech, and then with a laugh he'll start the fight. This one's relatively easy, as long as you take out his limbs first and have plenty of vials of water. Kill the final new god and get the last soul. You did it! Right? That's it, you can leave, or become a god. We all know which one you want. But wait. Lagarde. Lagarde tells you this is all for him. He is going to take this throne and ascend. Your party will question him and he'll give you the pain speech from Naruto about how it's better for one person to do horrible things and have everyone else be spared the darkness and to be able to stop all the wars as long as Lagarde himself does all these horrible things for the right reason. Hmm. Stop at you. He will ignore all your party's warnings and ascend. You're going to stop him. You sit on the throne. The 
The Void is a lot different from the rest of the game. It is the other side of the coin, as they say in the game. A place with no time. It is not necessarily scary in any sense of the word, it's more foreign. Alien-like. Which gives you a more wrong feeling than scary. There is these weird creatures here, like people melded together, which, uh... <clears throat> do the thing in the hospital that Shinji does to Asuka, if you... You know what I mean. There's pterodactyls without faces, made, made seemingly of human flesh that just sit there and watch you. And there's a terrifying presence that has caught your scent. Huh, I wonder what that... But you can find your companions strewn about. I found the knight in this playthrough who of course wanted to see the guard, and I found the mercenary as well who, uh, well, succumbed to his despair here. After wandering aimlessly for a while, I followed these wooden planks and I found a guard. He was speaking in a calm way, asking how long it's been. To him, it's been a hundred years he's been standing here. He asks what the meaning of suffering is. And he said that bliss and paradise couldn't exist without it. To live is to suffer, and the only thing that makes sense to do is to find meaning in the suffering. From here, he'll ask if you'll bow to him. He loves you, unconditionally. Either way, he will release you from this place. He gives you a choice. Bow, or deny him. And I choose to bow. After all the horrible stuff I've witnessed in this game, I don't think I would be strong enough to combat it. And if I can't, I would want to give my strength and power to someone who I believe can. Good or evil, right or wrong is irrelevant. There's no such thing. This is an exact mirror of Griffith's philosophy from the anime manga, Berserk. Berserk makes a point that if someone is doing wonderful things in the name of evil, does it really matter? If the world prospers and he's doing it for selfish reasons, but everyone else is in paradise, does it really matter? It doesn't really matter. From here, he sends you back to the start, allowing you to leave. It says you live happily ever after in a life from now on, just knowing that the darkest parts of humanity and what is going on in the deep. You have ancient knowledge that you'll live with. You know the old gods and the new. In your later years, Lagarde unifies all the countries and everyone is living in harmony. You'll see him once more when you're old, unaged. Like no time has passed at all for him. Now calling himself the Yellow King, which uh, <clears throat> I, ha I have the book that this is referencing. In the book, the King in Yellow is a ruler with eldritch knowledge that is incomprehensible to the mortal man. So, is what Lagarde is doing wrong? I don't know, but can any of us say we'd do any better? By the way, this ending is just the plot of Berserk ending. This is considered the bad ending, but I like it for the point that it makes about the subjectivity of morality. So, I'll show you a little bit of the boss if you disagree with me and you want to go for a different ending. If you disagree with him, he will tell you that he loves you anyway, and he initiates the fight. He will look beautiful and godly. The king in yellow is his name, of course it is. Swaddled in a yellow cloth with a serpent around him. Strong antichrist vibes, by the way. Now in this playthrough, no matter what I did, I could not win this fight with just my two party members. But what happens after you beat him? Well, you'll have to beat the game yourself to find that out. So I leave it to you, audience. Which ending do you think is the right answer? I know there's a second game where you find the canonical answer, but what would you do in this situation? And if you're worried that I spoiled too much of this game for you to go play for yourself, uh, there is a ton I did not talk about. There are, there are several more endings where different things can happen. There are higher difficulties with higher bosses. There are plenty of secrets for you to discover on your own. Like, what happens if you find the girl and bring her to the depths like the first new god wanted? What's with the weird organs lying around that you can cut open? What's with that giant yellow mouth thing in the cave village? Who is the crow mauler? Can anyone become a god if Lagarde's not in your party? So that's it. You might ask me, so you broke your normal video formula to talk about an RPG maker game. Yes, I did. And I don't think there's a more unnerving game with a more captivating story. And to the guy that put this game in their top 25 on Twitter, thank you. Because I agree now. There is not a more captivating horror story than this. Now, I want to talk a little bit 
about the morality here. This isn't even in the script. As you can see, here's my 17-page script that I wrote for this entire thing. But I want to make a statement here about how I feel this game is different from any other horror game I've played. I feel when I was a teenager, I got a lot of these RPG Maker games that were, I mean, kind of creepy, but like... They weren't, like, actually fun games. They were more visual novels with an RPG maker side of it. And it was... I mean, they were cool. I really liked Ebe, if you've played that. And I liked and I liked the Crooked Man a lot as well. And then there's other ones like The Witch's House or, or other ones like that. And, I mean, they're okay, I guess. They're interesting stories, but, like, they're nothing that, like, really grips me, you know? This game, I feel like, has an incredibly fun gameplay cycle and an incredible story. And it's fucking terrifying. And that just makes a perfect horror game for me. I've played a lot of these, and I gotta say that this has to be one of my favorite horror games, if not my favorite horror game of all time nowadays. So, I thank all of you, if you've made it this far. Please leave a like and a comment, and if I see a lot of good feedback in this video, I know you'll want to see more videos like this. And I appreciate you all. I hope I see you next time. Uh, also, for some reason, there's a dating sim in this game if you beat it. I don't know why. <laughs>